Hello and welcome to the first ever Wine and Cheese with DKMS event. I'm Georgina and I work on the fundraising team at DKMS. I am so excited and so thankful for everyone that has signed up, joined us tonight and already donated. I really can't wait to get going to learn more about making that perfect match of cheese and wine. But before we do, I would like to give you a little bit more information about DKMS and what we do and how you can help us tonight. Every 20 minutes, someone in the UK is diagnosed with blood cancer. For many of these people, their best chance at survival is receiving a blood stem cell donation from a complete stranger. However, finding that perfect match is a lot like winning the lottery. There's so many different genetic markers that all need to match up perfectly. So at DKMS, we aim to add as many people to the global stem cell registry as possible to increase the chances of someone finding their life-saving match. It costs us £40 to add each of these people to the register. And we rely on the generosity of our supporters, fundraisers, donors, and money from events like this to help us to do that. If you would like to support us in turning these delicious wine and cheese pairings into potentially life-saving donor and patient pairings, then please do visit www.gofundme.com forward slash wine cheese and donate now. Your donation will help us to give more people with blood cancer and blood disorders a second chance at life. Now, without further ado, I am so excited to introduce our host tonight. Ollie Smith is known and loved across the UK and the world for his energy and excitement and enthusiasm. He brightens many weekend mornings with his column in the Mail on Sunday's U magazine. We really can't wait to learn more about wine and cheese pairing and also just to have the chance to ask some of our burning questions to Ollie and get to know him a little bit. So please join me in raising a glass to a fun, informative and life-saving evening. Good evening, ladies and gents, and welcome. I'm delighted to be supporting DKMS today on World Blood Cancer Day. I'm wearing my red, I've got my T-shirt on, and I cannot wait to take you through five different wines, five different cheeses from around the world. It'll be a taste sensation, and the most important thing of all is that we have some fun together. If there's any question at all that you would like to ask me, it can be about wine, it doesn't need to be about wine. You could ask me where I get my wardrobe from or what I do in my spare time. I don't mind, you can ask me anything. Georgina will be joining me and she will very carefully funnel those questions through to me. So whatever you'd like to know, please do ask, I'm here for you. So to kick off, I think the first thing to say is I absolutely love wine and I love pairing wines, not just with different foods, different people, different moments, different occasions. It, for me, the whole thing about wine is about listening to other people and finding out what they really love. It's something that connects us. I started out working in a wine shop, delivering boxes, and I hadn't a clue what was inside. I couldn't barely pronounce all the names. And that's what really got me interested. It was different languages, different people, loads of cultures, these bottles becoming emblematic of their place and all going out into the universe to spread a little bit of joy. And I think it's the perfect, perfect way to begin the bank holiday weekend. So wine number one I'm gonna show you tonight is the Y series Viognier from Yolumba. And these guys are down in Australia and Aussie wine was really kind of what got me into it because they spoke about flavors in language that I could understand in a really informal, fun way. And that really grabbed me. And I thought, if this liquid sunshine tastes half as good as they <laughs> say it does, I'm gonna be riding that wave all the way to Wine Island for the rest of my days. And I've paired it this evening with a Brie. This is a Brie de Mo. I could do my hilarious hello. It's for me. Uh, Brie de Meaux comes, I find it funny. Brie de Meaux comes from outside of Paris and Brie works with Viognier because they're both quite mellow. Now I'm gonna be talking a lot about flavors and how they interact and why the pairings work. But the truth of it is really and truly, it's all very personal. And in the same way that we all have our favorite bands or books or TV shows, you're gonna have your favorite cheese flavors, your favorite wines, and also your favorite countries that you enjoy them from. They all taste a little bit different. So really what I'm saying is, wine is all about you. And that's the way it should be. So first things first, when you're tasting a glass of wine, give it a swirl. It's been cooped up in that bottle for far too long. It cannot wait to get out and express itself. And all you're really doing is turning up the volume on the aromas. So if you give Viognier a sniff, 
What you find with Viognier is it tends to smell and taste a little bit like apricots and peaches. Now, I'm, I'm not massively one for giving really descriptive flavor, disc flavor kind of notes because it can be off-putting. I would prefer to talk about, you know, lightning strikes from citrus thunderclouds because it's more fun. But in this case, Viognier really does smell and taste quite peachy. So if you're a fan of like peaches and cream, pe peach melba, anything like that, or if you've ever walked through a market in the Mediterranean and smelt those peaches, it is exactly that. And Yolamba do a brilliant job making it because I'm pretty sure they're the oldest wine family in Australia. I think they started out in 1849. Uh, but they're in South Australia with this. Loads of warmth, ripens up the grapes beautifully. You get that kind of mellow character. So some wines can be quite sharp and pointy and they can be a little bit citrusy. Mm. This is pretty round, pretty plush, pretty easy going. It's the sort of wine that you can happily chug back at the barbecue. It loves to be paired with sunshine and prawns sizzling away. But with brie, the reason the pairing works is because brie too has that creaminess. And I love the notes I got with the cheeses, by the way. I don't know who's responsible for these, but this was great. Soft and creamy. The flavour is nutty with a hint of mushroom. I should go go. As it ages, <laughs> it develops pungency and even greater depth, very much like me. Um, so I, I actually quite like a brie that is a bit, it's not kind of running off the kitchen table, but I quite like it when it's relaxed a bit. Uh, and one of the things that I always kind of have a, a running battle in my family is how long to take it out of the fridge before we eat it. Because, you know, I quite like it when it's just thinking about becoming liquid. But other people in my family, I won't name names, they quite like it when it's firm and chalky. What's that all about? If you're a firm and chalky person, I don't judge. You are welcome in my home. But, but really, we have to have a conversation about it, preferably over a glass of Viognier. Cheers. I'm delighted to see you all here. Throughout the evening, if you've got anything you want to say, anything you want to chip in, please ask and Georgina will funnel it to me. The main thing tonight is that I want you all to explore your own kind of tastes and decide, if you are tasting along, which wines you really love and which ones speak to you. And if you're not tasting along, you know, have a think about them. And if you can't quite fit a question in or if you've forgotten what I've said at any point in the evening, best way to chase me down is probably on Instagram at Ollie Smith. I'm more than happy to try and answer as many wine questions as I possibly can. Cheers, you beauties. Georgina, have we had any questions yet? Yes, so the first question we actually had was about glasses. So it does it matter what glass you're using um, for the tasting? That is a brilliant question. And um, yes, I mean, I immediately want to say, have a look at the gofundme.com forward slash wine cheese page and all will be revealed. But actually, the, the glass you use does have an impact. So there's a couple of things I would say here. The first thing is when you're having like a light, easy white wine, it's a bit like speakers with music. You can get away with something a bit smaller. When you've got a big kind of profound red, you might want something a little bit bigger. So it's a bit like speakers. Tinny ones are fine if it's kind of high treble. With a big bass, you want your subwoofers. But what I think is most important about a wine glass is the shape. So this one here, if you have a look at that, if I'm professional and hold it in front of my camera, um, what you'll notice is the shape tapers in. And that's what you want to funnel the aromas at the top. I used to have lovely wine glasses with the kind of like tulip shape, mm. but they let all the aromas escape. So if you really want to get the best out of your wine, you want that kind of shape. And you also fill the glass to the point of return. And all that is, is where the glass literally turns in on itself. That gives you enough room to swirl it, to get kind of maximum enjoyment out of it. And while I'll say, you know, you can have big glasses for reds and little glasses for whites, when we do our professional wine tastings at press tastings, and I did a couple this week, I did Aldi and I did Waitrose and um, yeah, Majestic have very kindly helped us with these ones tonight, I should thank them. But when I'm doing those tastings, we actually use one glass for all wines to evaluate. So, you know, whites, reds, rosés, fortified fizz, we use the same set of glasses or the same glass more often than not. Uh, and that kind of gives a fair playing field to everything. I think that's the reason we do it. Uh, but if you're at home and you want to go completely bananas, yeah, definitely get the old crystal wear out, have some fun. I mean, it's theatre as well. You know, I, I always think, you know, alongside glassware, the other thing I love is decanting wine. Mm. You know, when you pour wine out from a bottle, part of the reason they used to do it was because there was sediment in the bottle uh, and that was to kind of get rid of it in the red wines. But actually, the act of pouring into a decanter aerates the wine and it expands it. So it just gives you literally more flavour and more aroma. And the shape of the decanter it doesn't really contribute anything at all. You know, you've got those lovely ship's decanters with the flat bottoms, mm. you've got those taller ones, and they're really elegant, and I love the theatre of them. 
But it's the act of pouring that really does it. So you could just get away with using a jug at home and an empty old milk bottle if it's really clean. If you've got a very clean flower pot, I won't judge you. I think it's fine. Totally fine. Pour away. Um, what you're looking for when you taste wine. So we talked a little bit about the characteristics of Viognier, this peachy grape that comes from France and has made its way to Australia. It was nearly extinct, actually. Not so long ago, there was hardly any left, but I'm really pleased to say it's having a, a real renaissance now, which is lovely to see. But what you want to look for in any wine, doesn't matter what the flavours are, it could be bubbly, it could be rosé, it could be still. There are two things that will always tell you whether a wine is really, really good or just okay. And the really, really good wines will taste and smell quite a few different things. Um, and the, the other thing they'll have is lasting long flavours. So those two things together will always indicate to you that it's been well made. And it's really like the difference between kind of flicking through an easy magazine, so it's something quite simple, or getting really engrossed in a proper novel or, you know, like a real gripping movie. And sometimes you actually want something quite simple, something good value, you know, quaffable, not doing too much, you know, having a chat, watching a movie, that's fine. But if you really want the wine to kind of go places and take you on that journey, you're looking for all that complexity and you're looking for those lasting flavours. Lovely question. I'm so sorry I didn't catch your name who answered it, uh, asked the question rather, but... Um, it, it was Jack from London. Jack from London, you totally rule. I'm very grateful to you for your question. I raise my glass to you, Jack. Cheers, <laughs> buddy. Have a top bank holiday weekend. I'm going to be mowing my lawn. What are you going to be doing? <laughs> tell me what you're doing. Please <laughs> tell me you've got some wine in your lives. That's what I really want to hear. So we'll move on to wine number two. We've been in Australia, wonderful country for producing wine. I just think the Aussies are so inventive. They've got such determination. I used to love like really quite, quite boozy Aussie Shiraz at 14, 15% alcohol. I've really found it understandable. I'm really delighted in the flavours. You know, these days they are still available, but Australia is making some super elegant, really interesting stuff. So I urge you, if you haven't tasted Aussie wine for a while, get back in there because they just keep changing. I love the evolution of wine regions. Uh, talking of which, our second bottle of wine tonight, I love this, whizzing across the world. We go from Australia to France. This is Ville Marin's Picpoul de Pinot. Uh, and whenever I used to say that uh, when my girls were growing up, they would just giggle helplessly. I'm not entirely sure why. Picpoul de Pinot uh, 2020, it's a brilliant glass of white wine. So here's the thing. If you are a fan of bright, sharper, light whites, such as Sauvignon Blanc, for example. I know Georgine's not a massive fan of Sauvignon Blanc, so this may not be for you. But if you are, Picpoul de Pinot should be top of your list. It comes from the south of France. And the one thing they always say about this particular wine is that the vineyards are basically almost in the sea. They say um, the terroir is la mer, you know, that literally the kind of roots are basically on these sandy slopes that lead down to the Etang de Tau. It's a wonderful part of France. And it, this is an amazing wine to pair with shellfish. But tonight, I have paired it with our wonderful goat's cheese. So this, hey on why goat's cheese? Um, it's been kind of, you know, wrapped in ash as they do, which is completely edible. But the core flavour of a young goat's cheese like this, it's only like three or four weeks old, is it has that really zingy, crisp, almost lemony brightness. So goat's cheese can be lots of different things. It can be quite sort of goaty and a bit, you know, funky, or it can be really laser fresh like this one. When you're having those kinds of flavours, Literally, a pickle de pinot, Sauvignon Blanc would work fine as well. Couldn't be a more glorious pairing. It's kind of like with like, you know, zing with zing. And when you're pairing things up, when you're looking for things to pair, you, sometimes you can contrast. Sometimes you might want to go with the flow. A great example of a contrasting flavour and kind of cheese combination is Prosecco, which is bubbly from Italy. It works beautifully with mozzarella. So mozzarella has this creamy character and it's quite luxuriant but it's not like radically heavy. Prosecco has all of that bubbly bounce. And when you taste them, what you realise is the flavours contrast, but the flavours are at roughly the same level of intensity. So you've got these textures that are contrasting, flavours that are roughly the same, and it is just one of those miraculous pairings. So Pitbull de Pinot like this has been going for a very long time in the south of France. And this particular one is made by a cooperative. Um, who are really working hard towards sustainability. They're moving towards organic wine. And what you can see from the colour immediately, if you look at a wine like this, is it's pretty light and bright. Now, if you see a wine in your glass that's white and it's a bit more rich than that, it's a bit kind of, I'm not going to say it's like Barocca or something like that, but you know what I mean. It's heading towards a more golden, honeyed character. Those are the ones that have been sloshing around in oak barrels and they can be a bit more savoury, they can be a bit more opulent, loads more texture. Pair those with really big creamy dishes, anything like quiche or fish in a cream sauce. Pick pool like this, light, bright colour, 
stainless steel fermentation. It's literally wine in high definition. It's crisp, it's zingy, it's delightful. And would I decant this wine? Do you know what? I probably would. Why wouldn't you? I mean, when wine tastes this good, don't you want to amp it up and turn it up to 11? Georgina, have we got any questions? So, uh, well, we have Michelle Savage, who says, say hello to the Reapum crowd. I'm sure that means something to Michelle. <laughs> the Reapum cloud, was it? The Reapum crowd, yeah. Hello, Michelle and the Reapum cloud. I'm more than happy to do it. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what it means, but I, I, I love you very much and I hope you're well and that your bank holiday is epic. Hooray. And just to give you an update, we're at £850 on the GoFundMe page. And then we've got one more question. We've got Ellie and Matt in Cornwall have asked if you've got any tips for a bank holiday red this weekend. They find Malbec a bit heavy with a barbecue. I love it. Hello, Ellie and Matt. I do. I do. I <laughs> totally do. So Malbec, um, Argentine Malbec, we've actually got one a bit later on in the tasting, I think is an alternative for something a bit lighter. There are loads of great varieties out there that actually could do the job. But I've been drinking a lot lately Gamay from France, and it's just one of those great varieties that is a bit lighter. It's a red... Uh, you'd find it in, in Burgundy. It comes from uh, the Beaujolais crew, especially, are amazing. But Beaujolais is basically made from Gamay. And it's a great, but I don't know how to kind of describe it, really. It's got, if you imagine a very, if you imagine like the, the smell of jam, like strawberry jam, but then something immensely silky, like, you know, a satin kite in the wind, it's really light. And yet it has all that summery, beautiful fruit. So it's almost like, you know, a rosé with, with big guns on it. It's mm. kind of one of those, you could chill it down in the summer and pair it with fish dishes. It's one of those wines that absolutely has plenty of character, but it won't kind of overwhelm. So my pick would be Gamay. I'd also give a shout out to English Pinot Noir. Brilliant stuff. And you've got some great Pinot Noir in Cornwall, actually, uh, with uh, Camel Valley, obviously their fizz. But I've been tasting more and more English reds that are light, bright and unbelievably beautiful. So, yes as well as wearing red, I'm happily going to start drinking some English reds more and more and more. Uh, so we've got our Ormarine Pic Paul de Pinot. Um, I, do you know, the first time I tasted Pic Paul de Pinot, I'll never forget it, I was in Clapham in London, and um, I'd been working not far away, and I was strolling through a French market that would come over to visit. Um, and it was when I was working in wine shops and kind of learning about wine. And I found this, and I remember the bottle, because it kind of has all these lovely emblems on it, and it's got the sea at the top, and it's all rather kind of adorable. But I remember it was there being sold from one of those little vans for like £3.50, which at the time I just thought, that's amazing. I remember having a little sample and thinking, I've never heard of this wine before. I don't know anything about it. I just know that it tastes like electric lemons and I have to drink more of it. And Pitbull, actually, the name comes from the French meaning lip stinger because it's so zesty. It kind of gives you this absolute, you know, it makes you feel alive when you taste it. Pairs beautifully with oysters, I should say, as well. But yeah, years later, from that van in Clapham, you know, I've actually travelled down there and, you know, you're kind of in the vineyards and they are literally, they are basically in the ocean. And that whole area around Set and Pezzanas, it's all basically just a giant triangle of easy drinking, brilliant, bright white wine. I get very excited about it. I can't wait to return. So obviously travel at the moment is a bit tricky, but I love that about wine that each of these bottles, you know, we're hopping from France and we're going to just go over the border into Spain for our first red of the night. And this is our Cune. Uh, Red Rioja. It's a Reserva 2016. Cunha stands for Compañía Vinícola del Norte de España. And I'm not a brilliant pronoun pronouncer of Spanish, but I think I did a pretty good job. If there's any Spanish speakers out there, feel free to give me a mark out of 10. Hola. Um, so I, I really love Rioja. And I think in Britain, it's one of those places in Spain that we've taken to our hearts because it produces... Look at this. What, by the way, why can't that be a ringtone? That lovely sound of wine just tumbling into a glass. I mean, I'd never be off the phone. That's the truth of it. So Cune Rioja. Um, I love Rioja because instinctively here in the UK, we like its kind of mellow, easy drinking, spicy character. But more than that, I remember the first time I was kind of getting into Rioja and I realised, you know, I was delivering these boxes with what I thought was Rioja written on the side. And then I learned from Eamon, the other store uh, guy who was with me, that it's this place, it's this place in northern Spain where they follow a certain recipe and a certain blend of grapes. In this case, it's Tempranillo, Garnacha, a bit of Mazuelo, um, and something else as well as in there. Um, but it's one of those recipes that has endured over time. And originally, you know, farmers would plant different grapes because they ripened at different times, a bit of an insurance policy to make sure they're going to get a harvest. But Rioja, they realised, we love the flavour. 
And we loved aging our wines in oak barrels. So we had these American vessels, these French vessels. And when they age the red wines, especially, it softens them, it rounds them out. And Rioja really is the kind of heartland of aging red wine. So if you've ever wondered what kind of really savoury, you know, sometimes you see those really savoury pricey wines on a wine list and you think, is it, is it really worth it? If you want a shortcut to those flavours, Grand Reserve Rioja, aged for like two years in a barrel, three years in the bottle and more, they really do taste like some of the world's great reds that have been aged to perfection. So, you know, you find them in the supermarkets, um, they've got great own labels and it is really worth having a go at those. So with this, of course, Cune Rioja, I had to take, I had to pair it with the Manchego. And I can't believe that that is still in its packet because if it wasn't, I'd be face planting right into it. Manchego uh, is, comes from La Mancha, just near Madrid, from the High Plain. And it's the, um, it's the Manchega, Manchega sheep. Um, so you get this kind of hard, quite nutty flavour. The texture is really what this pairing is all about. And you know what? It's really worth playing around with pairings. You know, tonight we're talking about linking up stem cell donors with uh, blood cancer patients. And that's kind of loosely why we've gone with the idea of pairing wines with cheeses to see, you know, how they compare and how they link up. The truth of it is that you see, with, a, with a wine like this, you know, and a cheese like this, you can play around a little bit. You can actually, with a, with a cheese board, for example, you can try pairing more white wines, for example, with cheese. And what I find is that white wines can let almost more of the flavours across a cheese board flourish. If you think about all of the intensities, the textures, the different characteristics, you know, pairing a red with some of them might swamp it. But in this case, a red with a manchego, a red Rioja, yes, please. I think we'll absolutely drink that. And considering these guys have been doing it since 1879, I think they just about know what they're doing. Georgina, far away if you want to ask me anything. I'm, I'm yeah, ready to got, rock. We've got a few questions um, here. We've got uh, Hugh from Cardiff is asking if there's any good boxed wines that you'd recommend. Hugh, Hugh, yes. Lovely to hear from you. Hi, Hugh. And um, I, cannot, oh, I cannot wait to return to Cardiff. What a brilliant city. To go. I mean, I love going to the pub in Cardiff. Let's just leave it at that. I'll leave that at the door. We'll talk about it later. Yes, there is. There's actually a company called Bag and Box, B-I-B, that do some pretty high-end stuff. They, you can find them online, um, or I'll, I'll try and remember to stick it on my Instagram. Um, and they are the Bib Wine Company, I think they call themselves. And they're great. You know, they've gone for higher-end wines that are, you know, no different really to others. The other one I just tried, actually, and I think it was from Lay and Wheeler, was a Provence, maybe it wasn't Provence, it was a rosé from the south of France. And I am recommending it in my column in the Sunday newspaper. It's brilliant. And it's one of those ones that, off the top of my head, I think it was about 60 quid for five litres, which is a, I think it worked out around a tenner or just under a bottle, which is a high standard for a box wine. And it tasted fantastic. I couldn't believe how good it was. And I think the thing to bear in mind with Bag and Box is it's just keeping the wine in good condition. You know, the balloon inside deflates with the wine, so it's not letting any air get to it. Um, you know, I think all of the things that we should be looking at with wine about sustainability, about glass recycling, about cans, about packaging, all of these things are really important conversations to be having. And I think the more quality wine we see in Bag and Box to you, uh, the better. Um, I want to know if you're a fan of Bag and Box, and if so, which one are you drinking? I used to buy, actually, Tesco Finest used to do a great big called a Pinot in a box, stack that up, you can make a house of Jenga and live in it. Marvellous. Uh, so, yeah, just a couple more points in the rocker and then we can have another question if you like, Georgie. Uh, Georgina, have we got one, actually? You would look to me as though you are about to ask one. I, I was just going to remind people that the GoFundMe page is live. Please follow the link down there and donate if you can to help turn all these amazing wine and cheese pairings into potentially life-saving um, donor and patient pairings if you can. So please click below. Thank you very much. And indeed, thank you so much. If you if you are able to donate, obviously, that's fantastic. And I didn't realise that only 2% of the UK population uh, have registered. It's just, yeah, amazing. I mean, obviously, the more, the better. Um, you know, these things come out of the blue. You know, my family, we've been touched by this in the past. And it's something that, yeah, you just... I think if we're already, you know, on the, on the front line to do something, so much the better. And obviously, if you can donate, thank you. Um, so, Rioja, so nice. Loosely, though, because I know we've got to get to all these wines tonight. If you ever get the chance to go to Rioja, please go. Fly into Bilbao. Go up there. It's. I always used to think it was going to be like, you know, watching the Westerns as a kid. It was going to be sweeping plains and roasting hot. And actually, it's really kind of mountainous in Rioja Alta where this wine comes from. And you get very distinctive influences of climate, which is another reason I love Rioja. It's so nuanced wherever you go. Up in the highlands, Rioja Alta, you get Rioja Alavesa, quite an Atlantic influence over the Cantabrian mountains. And then down towards Rioja Oriental, towards the Mediterranean, it gets much warmer. So you get these, 
you know, kind of almost like the engine room effect on the wines. Everything feels that much more hearty. And culturally, the food is just phenomenal. Like, I'm pretty sure they've got a denomination of origin for cauliflower. That's how fastidious they are. But one place you should go in Le Grogno is Calle Laurel, which is Laurel Street. So many good tapas bars, so many good wines, and they pair them all together. Loads of different specialities. I've always enjoyed going there. And I just think it's one of those special places that, yeah, if you do get the chance, warmly recommend it. So we're off. We've been to Spain. We've had a nibble of our Manchego. We've sipped our Rioja. I think it's time we went a little bit. Uh, I was going to say intergalactic, but what I meant was international. Um, so I'm going to pour a wine that I've been a fan of for a very long time, actually. I've always loved Vinalba. Vinalba are an Argentinian winery, and this particular wine um, comes from the Valle de Uco in Mendoza. And for years, and years, I've just seen on the label as well, I actually noticed this earlier, it's got a, a platinum award of 97 points from Decanter. So that's like basically winning the Olympics all the time in every single race. It's just amazing. Um, that's huge. I mean, for a while, how much is it? It's like 9.99. There you are, 9.99. Um, that really is amazing. So I've been recommending this for a long time. I love the winery because Malbec is one of those big grapes, right? It's very hearty, full of flavour. It's really good if you're thinking about having a barbecue early in Matt, you know, you kind of on for the Malbec, otherwise stick to the lighter gamay. Um, but for me, this one's interesting for a load of reasons. It's blended with another grape called Toriga Nacional. So blending wines together is all about balance, sort of about harmony, and it's all about finding something within the wine that unlocks an extra dimension. So I've blended quite a few wines over the years, and I'm really interested by the very tiniest addition of an unlikely component can have a radical effect on the overall flavour, texture, aroma, everything. So when you're judging these wines, if you are tasting long or next time you've got a glass of wine in hand, it doesn't really matter what it is, try and think about the sense of balance of a wine. You know, as with anything, there really isn't a right and wrong, but one thing that I can say for sure is the more harmonious a wine is, the more, for example, the aroma and the flavour have a sense of balance and proportion. And the more that the whole thing seems to be it sounds a funny thing to say, but sort of at ease in its own skin. You know, you really just, it's almost like it's imperceptible. It's, it's really great wines in a lineup. They don't shout so much as whisper. They're just like quite relaxed. They're like, I'm just quite balanced and brilliant. And it's really interesting when you zoom in on that and then you hand them out to people, how the effect, you know, is on the evening because they just resonate. They're wonderful. And this is a great example. So we're in Argentina, right? We're up in the Andes. It's pretty hot in the day. And of course, at night, it gets really, really cold. You know, we're high up at altitude. You know, you can almost wear a spacesuit to make these wines and harvest the grapes. And I've been very fortunate. I visited the uh, wineries in Mendoza and Argentina. And what I love about it is that the, the vineyards are so high, you get this ultraviolet, intense light. And the effect on the fruit is basically to give it absolute glory. Um, rather than any kind of funky flavours or savoury stuff, Argentinian Malbec tends to be just exuberant. And almost like, you know, vividly tropical or something. There's, there's something scented about it. You know, and I've heard people say, oh, it's, it reminds me of lavender or roses or something. But there's, you know, palmer violets, you know, that sort of thing. That is unique. And I just love it when I taste it and smell it in those wines. Malbec as a grape. I love it with kind of quite fulsome flavours. And we were going to pair it with the Pecorino tonight. However, I've got a replacement. I've got a Brevi Napoleon. So this is a firm cheese. <clears throat> I'm going to read from my cue card here. Last minute edition, uh, Brevi Napoleon, instead of Pecorino, from the Pays Basque region of France, this hard cheese takes its name from the shape of a local mountain. I love this. The profile of which is reminiscent of Napoleon. Now, I couldn't pick out Napoleon's profile. Well, I probably could actually pick out his profile. I just think of his hat. Uh, matured for six months, Brevi Napoleon is made from the milk of sheep that graze the high meadows of the Pyrenees. Mountains. Uh, it's ivory in colour with a mottled brown rind. Flavour is sweet and nutty with fresh grassy tones. And pairs well, guess what? With full-bodied reds. Yes, it does. So firm cheese, you know, and you could take this all the way and think like Parmesan or, you know, ch mature cheddar. Those kinds of cheeses, right? They're really densely packed. And what they all tend to have in common as well is they are all quite, quite salty. They're quite intense in that character. And if you get a nice, silky, big wine like this, they just work so beautifully. And Malbec originally was like one of these really robust grapes with a thick skin from southwestern France. And it, it kind of made these very famous wines called the Black Wines of Cahors. They're really like properly muscular. It's like wine, but wearing a suit of black current armour. So pokey and powerful and hefty, you know, that it just takes all comers. So you need to basically have 
you know, I mean, the most heavy and rich kind of roast ox is what you need with it, really. But in Argentina, you take Malbec, it gets its passport stamped, it arrives, and suddenly it changes and transforms. And this is the other thing that I find amazing about wine growing is where you are in the world has a profound effect on how the flavors taste. You could take the same grape, make it in exactly the same way, but it would still taste different depending on where it's grown. And if you're a gardener like me, I love my garden, but you know, there are some patches that are a bit shadier, some that are a bit more free draining, you know, others that are on a, on a slope and you get to kind of feel out which things really thrive there. And what's been wonderful, you know, in my lifetime is to see just how well Argentinian Malbec has done around the world and how pleasing it is. So these, the other thing about this is the Malbec and Tariga Nacional. Tariga Nacional is a Portuguese grape that goes into port making and it has this wonderful fragrant spicy character not only are they blending two grapes together, they're also blending two winemakers. You've got Hervé, who makes the Malbec in Argentina from his 45-year-old uh, vines. And then the Tariga Nacional, also in Argentina, is made by a Portuguese winemaker called Rui. And they do it as a little project together. And that's what wine is. Yeah, it's all very well talking about these wonderful flavours locked up in the bottle. But actually, it's about people coming together, you know, celebrating their passions and all of the good things of life. So... Yeah, this wine is kind of emblematic of a lot of different things to me. And the fact that it's won a platinum award at the Decanter Awards. I mean, well done. Bravo. I wish I had a medal. I hadn't got one. Cheers. Georgina, dive in with any questions while I'm sipping so, away. So we have had a question from Ellie and Paul. Can you recommend a wine to have with a curry? Ellie and Paul, I yes, and I'd be delighted to. So... It's kind of one of those questions that depends which direction your curry is traveling in, but I'll give you kind of a couple of bases to cover. Spicy food tends to make wine taste a little bit sharper. So I would avoid any kind of really light, bright white wines. Even things like Pinot Grigio can get a little bit, you know, tangy when you, take, when you taste them with spice. However, take the same grape, Pinot Grigio, and ripen it for longer, and it's called Pinot Gris. And it grows in Alsace, and it grows in New Zealand, it's exactly the same grape. It's just stylistically made in a richer style. So it basically hangs on the vine for a bit longer, takes on this wonderful pinky, dusky hue. And it's a great variety that just gets so peachy and has the most delightful texture. And those are the cues you're looking for when you're pairing with spicy food. So the all-rounder with a spicy dish is, for me, Pinot Gris, without question. And one of the best pairings ever is Pinot Gris with chicken tikka masala you know, which we love in the UK. And it's one of those dishes that I've always loved since I was a young kid. And, and I just think to find a wine that is such a slam dunk blows my mind. Uh, there are loads of other pairings, though. I mean, I, th I think with things like Thai food, if you're looking for those more spicy, vibrant, sharper, you know, almost kind of, you know, they have lots of lime and coriander. Then Aussie Riesling is really good. Clare Valley Riesling. It's like a, a laser beam of a wine. If you imagine literally someone's focusing a lime citrus fruit somewhere deep into the back of your eyeball. It's kind of like that, really intense and bright. I'm like, whoa, um, I love that, those wines. And you can actually pair red wines as well with curry. As I discovered years and years ago, I was in Benares restaurant in London, which Axel Kotchar was running. And um, I remember going in there and I was served a really amazing lobster curry. Mm. And it's spicy curry in a fairly rich, dark sauce. And I thought to myself, oh, I wonder what the smell is going to pair. It was a great friend of mine at the time, actually. He's no longer there. But I remember he came out with a red Rioja. And I thought, no, 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 no way. And it was so beautiful. And it was one of those moments where you realise, actually, it was not really about the lobster. It was all about the sauce. So whenever you're pairing wine with food, actually, I think always pair it with the biggest flavour on the plate. Might be a dressing, might be a rub, could be a marinade. You know, just think of that big, bold flavour and then pick your wine accordingly. And one final spicy wine recommendation I can give you, especially if it's uh, along the lines of Chinese cooking, Sichuan in particular, is rosé. You know, good old rosé from Provence is such a good all-rounder. And, you know, Bordeaux rosé, Spanish rosé, a bit more robust. You know, wonderful rosado wines. Fabulous with a bit of kind of aromatic spice. The only exception, I'm really going for it here. I'm literally giving you every spicy dish under the sun. The only exception, uh, picking duck, that works with really aromatic wines like Torrentes or Gewürz Tramina are amazing. But yes, thank you for the question. And please ask any more you like, because I love this. It's literally like, it's like blankety blank or something. Wine bingo! <laughs> so we have had a question from Nicholas McGrath and he is asked, he has asked if you were allowed one last bottle of wine, what would it be? Well, first of all, Nicholas, I hope that doesn't happen for a while. And secondly, I'd love you to be with me because I think 
you know, a part of it would have to be sharing it with someone. So I pick you because you've asked a lovely question. And I think if I really and truly answer that question, uh, I, I, I'm really torn, actually. I love English fizz. I live in Sussex and around me, I'm, I moved here from London uh, probably 20 odd years ago. My wife's from Brighton originally, so we could have hovered around here. And there were one or two vineyards and now there's like a billion and they're all really good. So I really like English fizz. So that would be on the short list. I think it's really zingy, really kind of electrifying, really fun. And I'm proud that it's our homegrown work. It's great. Um, I also really like Greek wine. I've been to Greece every single year of my life, except last year, obviously, uh, since I was 18 years of age, I think. And I go to a different region every time. I love their informality with food. I love their boutique wine production. Their lexicon of local grape varieties is so fantastic. You never taste flavours like that anywhere else in the world. So you might get a very scented white wine that tastes, you know, like drinking liquid jasmine flowers or a really lovely red that makes you think, oh, it's kind of, it's almost, it's almost like something, I don't know, someone's managed to melt a leather belt. But I, I love that. That sounds really impulsive now that I think about it. However, I really love the charm of the characters of those wines. However, the top wine, um, Nicholas, would be a Tokai from Hungary, which is a sweet wine. And a long time ago, I entered a wine competition called Wine Idol which not many people saw. Um, it was a bit like Pop Idol, but it was kind of like trying to find a new voice in wine. And uh, I managed to win it. And actually part of my kind of wine um, presentation that I had to make was on Hungarian Tokai because I really always loved it. And it's an unusual wine. It's not a, a wine you would drink every day. It's a sweet wine. And it kind of reminds me of, it, I love apricot jam. Like if you left me alone in a room with a jar of apricot jam and the lid was off, you know, we'd be we'd become one very quickly, and um, I wouldn't even feel ashamed. I would I'd feel a, a, co a combination of pride and um, delight at the next jar. I just cannot get enough of it. Got jam. I've always loved it. So it tastes a bit like that, but it has this magical acidity. So when I was growing up, it was opal fruits, then it was starburst. But you know what I'm talking about—that sweet zingy character. And it's really hard to get that right in a wine, and it is it's thrilling and a little bit goes a long way. So if you have it chilled, nice bit of blue cheese works a charm, but it's one of those wines that you can luxuriate in and it's a conversational wine. So when we're sitting there enjoying it together, you know, it will provoke conversations and they age the wines, these wonderful old cellars. Like if there's any Lord of the Rings fans out there, they basically look like, you know, going into, uh, into the old Dwarf Lords halls. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, the halls of Moria, um, because they're very dark and they're covered in these old black velvety what do they call it cladisporum cellare it's like a it's like a fungus like a mold but it's like the velvet coat of a mold and you go into these huge caverns covered with it and that fungus i know this all sounds really weird but it's what keeps the right humidity the right kind of level of everything and my goodness me the wines can age for ages so i've given you a very long answer to a very simple question but i would love to share a glass of hungarian taco with you nicholas thank you and then just to give an update, we're at £1,600 on the GoFundMe page. So that's enough to fund 40 registrations, if that's if my maths is right there, 40 registrations of potential lifesavers. So thank you so much, everyone, so far. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much for, for all your donations. That's immensely kind. That really is. Um, it is such a brilliant cause to support as well. And, you know, here we are, you know, we're enjoying a few glasses. It's the back holiday weekend. Uh, but it is, yeah, it's just great to keep in mind, you know what we can do for other people it's always yeah front and center so yes last thing i wanted to say about our lovely malbec was the malbec vines they're about 45 years old and a question i'm sometimes asked is you know what does it mean if i see old vines or vie vigna on a label and should i bother with it you know should i pay the extra quid or two the answer is yeah you should because older vines produce a bit less fruit but the fruit they do produce has quite a bit of character to it so yeah where well, their kind of volume is maybe less their, in, their character is more. So you've got a bit less liquid, a bit more expensive, but wonderful expression. So if you see it on a label, definitely worth giving it a go. And vines can live for a long time. I remember shaking hands with like a, you know, wine in Chile that was uh, a Pais vine, I think, that was more than a century old. I mean, to say it was like going backstage and meeting the entire E Street band all at once doesn't really do it justice. It was more like kind of getting a proper hold of Gandalf's staff, if, if you see what I mean, it's, you know, magic stuff. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I really love the enduring capacity of vines. You know, they can, they can really live for a long time. And some of them are still producing fruit. You know, and I think of an island like Santorini in Greece, um, where you've got these wonderful ancient vineyards and the way they grow them, 
is in kind of bird's nests on the floor, on the ground, just because they want to protect the grapes from the heat, from the wind, from the sun. And they, the way they regenerate them is just lop the tops off and let them grow again and weave them into these basket shapes. So the root system of those vines, you know, some people, we just don't know how, how old they are, but they could be hundreds of years old, you know, and it is really sobering to think these are, these are like existing uh, like organisms, if you like, you know, they're, they're, yes, they're places, but this thing, you know, has just made it its own. And you're, you know, in a wine like that, you're really drinking a place, you know, you really are. The wines of Santorini is a great recommendation, actually. If you haven't tried white wines from Greece, they are so like, Oh, they're so tense, you know, they're so shrill and bright and like, oh, it's like a flashlight. But they've got this saltiness as well. I could go on forever about it. But yeah, if you like bright, you know, amazing quality wines like Chablis, taste the Nasiatico from Santorini. Absolutely incredible. Which brings me to our final red of the evening and our final pairing. I hope you've all been nibbling along and having a nice, uh, a nice glass. Um, we are off from Argentina across the Andes to Chile. And this is... Santa Rita's Medalla Real Carmenere. Um, and it's, um, it's a wine that I'm really excited to pour because Carmenere is a great that I just think deserves far more plaudits. Um, we'll come to Carmenere, but I'm just going to tell you briefly what I've paired it with, which is my smoked Gouda or Gouda, depending on how you want to say it. Um, smoky flavours, big, bold, smoky flavours need a big, bold wine. And if you're a fan of Malbec, you should be drinking Carmenere. And if you want to try something with a curry, a red wine, Going back to our question from earlier, Carmen is not a bad shout, actually. Bit of lamb, rogue and Josh, dollop of Carmen Air, invite me round. Uh, smoked Gouda is obviously quite a pokey flavour. They smoke it with hickory trees. Um, it takes on that smoky character and it has all of that tang as well. Carmen Air is a great variety, always has a certain spiciness to it. So if you think of like somebody shaking a few peppercorns over your wine, you're not far away, actually. And it has, again, a kind of bold, you know, deep character to it. Chile is the most incredible country for producing wine. And, and these are all, I should have said, all these wines I'm talking about are available at Majestic. If you haven't gone out and bought them, you know, if you want to try any, I'm sure they're still on the shelves. Chile, though, oh, I remember the first time I went there, I was filmed, for, oh, it was the second time, actually. The second time I was filming a documentary called Descorchando el Sur, Uncorking the South, uh, which was great fun with a film director, actually, called Silvio Coyotti, who I absolutely love. And he... If you just basically imagine Stanley Kubrick, you know, in South America, that's him. He's just a legend. Like, he's an absolute master of the lens, but just a genial delight to be around. And I learned so much about filming from him in strange locations. I remember once we were up in Andy and uh, filming a piece about wine, and a llama started to eat my hair. And he just let the cat, it thought it was a straw bale. I mean, I, was, I think I was bleaching it at the time, and it was enormous. Um, but I remember Sylvia just saying, yeah, keep it rolling, keep it rolling. I was there, get this thing off me. And it, it obviously made for great TV. So, yes, just roll with it was the um, very much the, the thought. But Chile, I've always loved since my first visit when I went and visited all the vineyards, because if you think of it like a long sort of uh, basically a load of sausages hanging down through the air, all the climates are different. In the north, you've got deserts. In the south, you've got glaciers and you everything in between, like the Mediterranean climate, the British climate, literally incredible. And on one side, you've got the Pacific Ocean acting like a great big air conditioning unit. On the other, you've got the Andes, which have the height, the exposure. You've got so many soil types, so much heritage, so much talent. I think of the talent in Chile, in the wine growing, and it's not just about making the wine. They're eking out these corners of Chile that are so impressive for vineyards. There's a place in the north called Elki Valley. And the vineyards, I mean, they're so high up, it's unbelievable. You almost don't need to prune them. They're tiny, almost like tiny tea bushes, like the start of Camelwick Green. And they produce these really intense, beautifully vivid wines that when I first went and filmed there, they weren't that expensive. And now I really have to save up if I want a glimpse of them. But oh, what a treat. Um, so this particular wine, yeah, founded in 1880. These wines, I mean, they've been doing it for absolutely ages. Carmen Air, spicy grape variety, started its life out in Bordeaux in France as a blending grape. And then it kind of got a bit forgotten about. So when you smell it, it's always unmistakable. This little crackle of pepper. And it is, I find it delightful. It's somewhere somewhere between black pepper and almost like cloves, that sort of, yeah, aromatic spice. But it always has presence in the glass. And for years and years and years, chili was planted with what they thought was Merlot. And it turned out was Carmenere. Someone had made a mistake and it was a lot of it had been distributed. So it was one of those awkward moments when 
you know, in Britain especially, we've been drinking a lot of Merlot from Chile. This is absolutely delicious. I love it. And then the good old Chilean said, actually, so sorry, we've been making Carmen Air. It's not Merlot at all. And we just went, yeah, fine, fill her up. We love it. And that's, you know, as it should be. It's all about the flavour. But still now, if you go to Chile and you say, you know, I'll have a glass of Merlot, you have to say, I want Merlot, Merlot. You have to say it twice to make sure it's Merlot. If you ask for Merlot, you, you might get a Carmen Air. But it's just, it's one of those quirks in wine that I just love because they made something that could have been seen as a bit of a disaster into a total success story. And Carmen Air in Chile is just emblematic of the place. It needs a long time to ripen. And Chile has a brilliant climate, you know, for long summery seasons. And this one comes from Colchagua, actually, uh, which is a place uh, just south of Santiago where it's very hot in the day and very cold at night. And I know this because I was filming there, a night harvest. And in the day I was there in my T-shirt, rather this one, my DKMS T-shirt, which I should, should have been holding up more often. Sorry, Georgina. Um, but yeah, I was there filming the other day and it was absolutely sizzling. And then I had to do this thing in the evening and the sun goes down and suddenly the continuity, the great director, Silvio Chiazzi, is like, no, you have to stay in your T-shirt. And I'm, I'm literally turning into a human limpet. And no, you just have to keep going. It's your fault. You wore the T-shirt. And throughout the entire night, I was just, I've never been so cold. But what that does for the vines, it allows a long hanging time. Cold nights, hot days, you know, it kind of slows it down and then speeds it up again. So you get this wonderful long ripening time which is what Carmen Air needs. Georgina, any questions? So we, we're on just over £2,000 now, which is fantastic. And Mike from the Repum crowd, previously mentioned, has joined the register because of this event, Stem Cell Register, so that's fantastic news. And in terms of questions, we have Stefan and Leah are asking, what's a good palate cleanser between wines? Oh, Stefan and Leah, that's a great question. And thank you, Mike. Um, that's really, really cool of you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, so, Stefan Alia, palate cleansers. There's a few. There's a few. It sort of depends what you're into and what you're, what you're drinking. For white wines, bite of an apple, actually, really good. Really kind of, you know, good acidity, keeps it kind of all fresh. Red wines, black olives, I find, you know, reset the whole thing. Um, nothing like a good old kind of 10 steps back in a glass of water as well. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll taste upwards of, you know, more than 100 wines in a, in a day sometimes uh, because we're sitting through you know press tasting compiling them obviously i'm not drinking them that would be not okay it's spitting them out and evaluating them in very small quantities um yeah and it's something that you kind of it's like anything in life the first time i was at a big tasting i remember thinking i just i'm finding it really difficult i can't really concentrate they've all blended into one and it's like anything you know i once trained to run a marathon and i started out i couldn't run 20 minutes and you know three months four months of training Run a marathon, it's an unlikely story, but true. And it's the same with anything in life. When you focus and apply yourself, you know, you can really kind of learn to do it. But if you are, yeah, cleaning the palate between, I mean, I always think as well, it's quite nice. It's a bit old fashioned maybe, but in a meal, I quite like the old sorbet before the pud or before the cheese course. You know, I remember when I was a kid, it was all those metal little cups and a little bit of lemon sorbet. If you were really lucky, or a posh restaurant, you had a bit of that, or an orange sorbet. <gasps> I remember the first time I had that, I thought, what is this? Wizardry, orange sorbet. Um, but I, again, it kind of partly it's the temperature of that, you know, as long as it's not too sweet. Um, another one, you know, people do swear by is kind of Carl's Water Biscuits. Um, I, you know, texturally, they can be a little bit kind of challenging, but a lot of people really like that. You know, if it's me, I'll take, take a bite of an apple, to be honest, that's, that's the way I do it. Um, you know, or just another glass of white wine. You know, why not? Absolutely. Um, and just getting back to, um, yeah, Chile, just the, the, the opportunities when they do open up for travel. It's I highly recommend any opportunity for if you are thinking of a wine trip. You know, the thing that we're obviously talking about linking people, link, linking donors with patients and linking wines with cheeses here tonight. But it's also linking people with people. This is the most important thing in places. And when we get out there again, I remember the first time I flew to South America, I hadn't a clue what it would be like. And I'd learned a bit of Spanish and I was obviously really excited. But you can never really ever get under the skin of a place. And as you go there and, and with my job, you know, it's so interesting because on Zoom in the last 12 months, it's been fabulous to taste the wines, talk to the winemakers and the wine growers. But there's nothing like being in the place, the soil under your feet, the natural kind of aroma of the place. You feel the characteristics of the weather. You feel what the culture's like you know when you're in buenos aires and there's dance and tango music or if you're in you know germany and there's pristine rieslings growing against the mosul river and it's just reflecting the light cascading back up to the heavens and it was wonderful kind of lakes of, of south island and new zealand and all of the different places in the world where 
people dedicate their lives to growing grapes and making wine, which I always found really enigmatic. And the truth is, it's a really tough thing to pull off. So if you imagine you go to work every single day of the year, and at the end of the year, it's entirely possible that someone will say to you, hey, you've done a really good job and turn up to work every day. Thanks for being here. Unfortunately, it rained quite a lot for a couple of months. So um, I'm not going to be able to pay you because we just haven't got anything. That's kind of how it goes, you know. And there was a late frost recently in the south of France. My friend Katie Jones, who's a wine grower down there, you know, it completely kind of took out almost entire vineyards. So a wine grower is there thinking, how am I going to get by this year? What will I have to sell? Not just next year, but in three, four, five years that they're blending. And it, it's, a, it's a real game of, you know, you have to love nature. You have to really uh, sort of accept the vagaries of chance. Um, and that's part of, the, part of the deal. Some vintages, some years are amazing. Others are really challenging. If you're a really good winemaker, you kind of plan for that. Nobody's perfect and there'll always be, you know, occurrences that are more challenging. But I just love their dedication. That's what always speaks to me about wine growers from all walks of life. And as I've traveled the world and met more and more of them, I've realized there isn't one particular criteria that creates a great wine grower at all. You know, all of them are in it for different reasons. And they might have formerly been a, uh, I don't know, worked in the law or worked trading the boards or, you know, just been doing any number of different jobs. But they find their way into it and they, they tend to never leave because it's a joy. And you pour a glass of wine for someone and if you get the recommendation right, that wonderful feeling, that resonant connection, no better feeling in the world. Georgina, I think you might be about to ask me a question. Yeah, I have one from Caroline. And she's asking that her, her dad bought her a couple of bottles of wine about 34 years ago when her daughter was born. And she said, it probably tastes like vinegar, but how long can you take, can you keep a bottle of wine for? Great gift, Caroline. I always <laughs> say to people, if someone gives you a gift, you know, crack it open at the earliest opportunity, you know, stick the bath on on a rainy Monday. It's yours, you know, enjoy the day. I, it depends on the wine is the truth. Like really long lived wines include Madeira, Ports, they can live forever pretty much. I've tasted, I once tasted a champagne from, I think it was like 1914. It was certainly the, the sort of early years of the First World War. And it was totally drinkable and intact. High acidity is a really good preservative in wine. The bubbles were sort of still there, but it didn't matter. It was just the fact that it was enjoyable. And what tends to happen with white wines as they get older, they get richer and more savory. So if you're a fan of like hazelnuts, you know, pine nuts, um, walnuts, age your white wines. If you're more of a fan of, you know, fresh lemon, Granny Smith's apples, drink your white wines young. It, 34 years for a white wine would be pushing it, but there are wines that really can live that long. Great Burgundy could, certainly could. Um, Rioja might be able to. It all depends where it's from. So chase me down on Instagram or, or I'm online at various different ports of call via Facebook and Twitter and the usual places. Um, and I shall try and answer if you let me know the wine. But yes, they can absolutely live for 34 years. And what a beautiful gift. Almost though, you know, I've got an old wine um, that I don't think I'm ever going to open. I was, I was, I maybe I will, but it was a, it was a, just a bottle of Fee 2. And it was, a, you know, a humble kind of four quid bottle. And it was given to me years ago, like I, decades ago, on my first ever press trip to the south of France. And I just kept it as a kind of, as a gratitude thing I'm, i was so grateful and it still sits in my cellar and it's kind of almost like a lucky charm so who knows maybe i'll open it one day but but i would i should take my own advice run the bath open it on a rainy monday there you go uh, but what a lovely gift and, and I, I really hope the wine is intact um yeah barolo is another one that very can age very well but um lovely question thank you any other questions georgia um, we've got a fantastic one here from michelle which is where do you get your famous shirts from Michelle, I get them from, well, a variety of different places. You know, I'm, I'm, I, quite, I do quite like a, a charity shop. I like a charity shop. Um, I would give my, a shout out to Gresham Blake, who I've been buying shirts from for years and years, who is a, a really fantastic tailor in Brighton and has branches in, I think, London as well. You can buy things online, though, as well. Gresham Blake uh, is the place I get my shirts. And um, thank you for noticing. I sort of felt tonight I'd wear it, wear it red for uh, World Blood Cancer Day. Um, but I, you know, I was thinking, should I wear a red? No, but I thought, no, I'm going to wear my DKMS shirt. Um, but thank you for noticing, Michelle. Marvellous. Fantastic. And then one more we have is, do you get the same quality with the small 20 centilitre bottles of wine as you do with the full bottle? Oh, that's a great question. So there's been a, who was that from? That was from Sam and Steph in Tipton. Hi, Sam and Stephen Tipton. I would say you're going to see a lot more quality in those sizes. Uh, you know, the last you know, year and a half have been really challenging for lots of people in terms of wine. Sending little bottles has actually been an incredible way of hosting events or, you know, getting samples to, 
to journalists and so forth. But I think it's a really good format, actually, for, for tasting and finding your, your way through. Hi, in, historically, to be honest, the, the quality has not been amazing. But I do think we're seeing a, a revolution happening. So smaller bottles, definitely. The other thing I'd say, cans. Wine in cans are getting really good. The quality's up there. A little bit of fizz, you know, a little bit of cheeky white, cheeky red. I'm really enjoying that. Highly recyclable as well. So smaller format portable you know not so breakable so uh, yes i think we're going to see better quality and more little bottles and more little things of everything actually fantastic so i think before we wrap up i think i would invite everyone to raise a glass to cheers to all of those amazing people that are on the stem cell register ready and waiting there's 800,000 people in the uk but as ollie said that's only two percent of the population so we really need to register as many people as possible. And with today being World Blood Cancer Day, it's a really apt day to, to either make a donation to help fund a registration or to register yourself. So I really would like to raise a glass to everyone that's donated today, to everyone that's on the register, and also to Ollie to say thank ah, you for joining us. Not at all. Thank you so much to you, Georgina, for having me. Um, thanks so much to all of you for joining me at home. I hope you have just the best bank holiday ever. If you've donated, thank you so much. And if you've just been here, just, you know, hanging out, really great to be with you. And um, hopefully have some fun as well as, you know, raise some money for a brilliant cause. So I'm delighted to raise my glass. Thanks, DKMS. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.